just to share something small before you uh, hear Dan. Um, and I think it's really amazing to have someone from a faraway country coming to address everybody. Any more ado, Dan Winter. <laughs> well, don't steal the president's thunder, but I've invited Brian to do the official introduction for Dan. And Brian um, is our president, so thank you, Brian. Thank you, Ian. Good evening, members. Good evening, guests. And good evening uh, to our VIP, our very special guest. Hello, Dan Winter. Thank you, Brian. Now, a little bit about Dan, just to tell you who we've got here tonight. I think we're rather lucky to have him because tonight we have the pleasure of Dan. He's our guest speaker and he's only in Australia for, for a short time. I think he's got about a, uh, perhaps a month to go before he heads overseas. He comes originally from America, from the state of New York, not in the Big Apple itself, but uh, somewhere out on the, uh, the country, periphery. Country boy. Right, thank you. And. His expertise is that he spent virtually a lifetime uh, thinking hydrogen, talking hydrogen, and getting formulas and um, everything to do with hydrogen. So his uh, subjects are very close to our heart. Don has for many years experimented in testing and making serious inroads into the esoteric properties of hydrogen. And in conjunction with other um, experiments, too numerous to mention, he's found that uh, it's a good idea to have a working knowledge of fractals. Now, who's come across fractals? Fractals are a, um, a phenomenon which I'm sure he'll tell us about shortly. They're a repeating pattern. The golden ratio, now the golden ratio was known to the ancient Greeks. In fact, they considered it to be such a secret that they put it in as a uh, religious secret and wouldn't let the, um, the formula or the, the numbers out into the public domain. And uh, then frequencies and how to apply them. Now again we go back to the old um, uh, all of the masters of frequencies and we come up with the name Nikola Tesla. Now Nikola Tesla thought that he would go right through all the frequencies that he could get from the very lowest to the very highest and see what they do. Well he did that but there's an awful lot more to it. <laughs> I think it's more than just a frequency. Now, I think we should ask Dan to take the floor and fill us in on the gaps. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Brian, and I'd particularly like to thank Ian because Ian has really been a hero in being so dedicated to bring this, these alternative energy solutions and to make them truly shareable, I must say I'm continually impressed with Ian's uh, pure intention and his ability to be dedicated. So I'm inspired, Ian. Thank you for <laughs> being so dedicated. And he was very genuinely concerned that there would be something in a very understandable language for you tonight. So Ian's my 
judge to let me know if we get too abstract or technical or philosophical here. <laughs> All right. So at any rate, the title and subject of this evening's conversation is basically uh, Fractality as Key to Solutions to Energy Issues and uh, Implosion Based on Fractality as a Practical Solution to Energy Technologies and to Our Social Problems. So that's the generalized subject. On a, a slightly more technical level, what we're going to attempt to share is something very radical, actually. Oh, yes, actually, that's a good idea. We can take uh, oh, CD. Yeah, a couple of these. That's a fine idea. So what we're going to try to describe tonight is something very radical. It's the idea that a golden ratio perfected fractality and something called phase conjugation, where the waves conjugate, add and multiply, that this is the mechanism, the principle, and the cause of all centripetal and self-organizing forces, electronegativity, for example, and specifically including this is the cause and mechanism of gravity, the cause of gravity. Physics has been a bit arrogant not to know why an object falls to the ground, but I believe we can now say why an object falls to the ground for the first time. That this is the cause of life force, this is the cause of life, that this is the cause of perception, and this is the cause of peak perception, enlightenment. It's actually also the origin of alphabet and symbol, and it's the physics and cause and origin of color. This is fairly radical idea. I'm coming to you as an electrical engineer to describe a mechanism of how electric fields make gravity, life, perception, bliss, and even color. All of those profound mysteries, the mystery of alchemy, the mystery of fusion, the mystery of implosion, the mystery of perfect compression, which is the mystery that Einstein died with. He knew that infinite compression was the solution to his unified field, but no one told him what a fractal was. And even physics today has not yet conceived of what a fractal electric field is. But I believe we now know what a fractal electric field is, and I believe I have proof that it exists in the geometry of hydrogen, and that this is a precise model of that fractal electric field. So my job tonight in the first half hour or hour is to try to give you a very practical geometric visualization of that principle, that particular wave mechanic, fractality, phase conjugation, and why it is the origin of all centripetal and self-organizing forces, gravity, life, perception. That's pretty uh, ambitious, wouldn't you say? <laughs> Are we still pretending to be young? All right. So I would like to first describe to you how to imagine waves doing that. How could waves meet in such a way that they could create all centripetal forces? And I prepared some animations to help make that visual. On top here, we have what's called the caduceus of Hermes, seen from a side view and top view. In, in your science class, that's called perfect damping. And it's based upon golden mean ratio in amplitude and in wavelength. And that path to perfect damping, called the caduceus, is also an example of what in physics I believe is called phase conjugation, the adding and multiplying of phases. And if we take that as a spin path, Here is that same spin path. You see that spin path here? That is a spin path which we call, <clears throat> and, and Ian took very great care to be sure we had the right toys to have this conversation. Thank you, Ian. That is what we call two pine cones learning to kiss noses. <laughs> so when I say the word phase conjugation, I want you Im to imagine two pine cones learning to line up precisely to kiss noses, sort of like Eskimo kissing, I guess. But in fact, 
I'm going to suggest to you that that is, in fact, practically a key to the achieving of, a, of, of releasing energy from hydrogen. So here are those two pine cones. Do you see the two pine cones in red? Notice how perfectly they're aligned. Well, while you're looking at that, I'd like to tell you that when you get two lasers to do that in something called phase conjugate optics, two lasers are lined up to meet perfectly from opposite sides. You bring the two lasers to meet, and if they learn to kiss nose to nose, in phase conjugate optics, it's well documented that you have self-organization and what they call time reversal. In other words, order emerges from chaos. It's well known in physics, and it's called phase conjugation in optics, and that's the geometry that makes it work when two waves, like pine cones, screw into each other. And I'm here to suggest to you that's the reason that DNA works, and that's the reason that hydrogen works. And I would like for you to try to understand with me why that works. Why would it happen that when two pine cones, just like the two in red here, that's, by the way, what that is in red again, that's 10 spirals of the golden mean. That is a top-down view, clearly, of DNA, but it's also a top-down view of every living protein, because every living protein is five-sided based on golden ratio for that reason. And golden ratio is key to everything alive for an electrical reason, and that is it makes a centripetal force implosive, the opposite of explosive, a fractal attractor, if you will. And that ability to become centripetal, to implode, to create a force that draws to center, is the secret of life and gravity and hydrogen and energy and fusion and alchemy. And it's all based on one simple symmetry, and that's it. And I'm going to present to you later in my presentation this evening my new equation that is also proof that that is precisely the geometry of the hydrogen atom. So for now, at the beginning of this conversation, I would like you to understand mechanically as a wave function why this pair of pine cones kissing creates a centripetal force, a force that draws charge to center. Because if you understand why that pattern of waves of charge causes implosion, suction to center to happen, fusion, alchemy. If you understand how the centripetal force is created, you will then understand why gravity exists, why life exists, why hydrogen exists, and why perception exists, and why bliss exists. So it is very important to me that you understand why that geometry of waves makes a centripetal force. So that's our challenge at the beginning of this conversation. And I call that phase conjugation. I suggest that even though physics hasn't recognized it, in fact, it is self-evident that phase conjugation is optimized by golden mean ratio because only golden mean ratio solves the problem that is phase conjugation. You know, when you get married, they say, well, we're going to have conjugal relations. <laughs> what do they mean by that? What they mean by that is your DNA is going to get together with somebody else and decide which waves are shareable. I mean, which genetic material emerges from recursive crossing. And that's called conjugation of the DNA in the same way that waves conjugate. To conjugate simply means to add and multiply recursively. And the golden mean ratio is the only ratio that solves that problem. So to me, it is self-evident that golden mean ratio is the only solution to phase conjugation in all of physics. And that's news to people studying optics, and they need to learn that. Because in fact, if they knew how golden mean ratio solves phase conjugation, there would be breakthroughs in phase conjugation in optics. For example, we now know that when you shine lasers into living tissue to trigger and switch on and off cancer medicine, that the way to get a laser light into your flesh with the least burning is golden mean ratio. <laughs> Why? Because this is a geometry that creates non-destructive compression. 
Non-destructive compression is Einstein's nightmare. <laughs> there he's lying there. He knows that he could figure out how electric fields make gravity if he could understand non-destructive or constructive compression. But nobody told Mr. Einstein what a fractal is, which is by definition in mathematics, fractality is infinite compression solved. The problem is that electrical engineers haven't figured out what a fractal electric field is until, if I may say humbly, me. I have figured out what a fractal electric field is, and I know how to make it, and I believe we're going to do that to, un to release the energy of hydrogen, actually, because we're going to make the electric field between these radiators phase conjugate and release the energy of hydrogen. That's why we're here. So how does golden mean ratio solve the problem of adding and multiplying recursive constructive wave interference because when the waves meet they add and any two numbers in the progression added equal the following number infinitely and they multiply it's called heterodyning adding and multiplying it turns out that this is the only solution to geometry or waves that both adds and multiplies because any number in this sequence multiplied by 1.618 also equals the next number so you can take any two numbers, add them, and keep going forever. Or you can take any number and multiply by 1.618 and get the next number. For example, 0.618 times 1.618 is 1.0, and 1.618 squared is 2.618. <laughs> kind of sexy, right? <laughs> so this is a progression that solves a problem that nature has. How waves can perfectly meet. Perfect sharing for waves. Getting a little romantic here? OK. <clears throat> So the next thing you need to know is something that your local physicist doesn't know but desperately needs to know. And that is <clears throat> that this golden mean ratio is provably the solution to maximum constructive wave interference. <clears throat> so <clears throat> we wrote a software algorithm that added together a large number of wave harmonics <clears throat> Here we're adding a total of 16 frequencies, which are related by golden, golden ratio. And sure enough, if you add together a large number of wave harmonics in what's called a nonlinear medium, or simply a mixer, if you add them together and just keep causing the waves to converge and see whether there's constructive or destructive interference, and you write the right software to emulate that process, you find that when waves interfere by powers of two called the octave, they create maximum possible destructive wave interference. In other words, the least possible wattage of power emerges when waves interfere by powers of two or the octave. So our music based on octaves is actually maximum destructive wave interference. And the square root of two, similarly. The opposite of that is if you interfere a large number of waves by golden mean ratio, the ratio that produces maximum constructive interference is, you guessed it, golden mean ratio. This is a fundamental issue, which is a solution to a large number of problems in physics that scientists have not realized, that the golden mean ratio is the generalized solution to constructive wave interference. And that's why it's the solution to Einstein's problem. <coughs> because that's specifically how he stated it, the solution to maximum constructive interference is the solution to maximum compression, and that was the statement of the problem of the unified field, infinite implosive compression. So the geometry of that, to make this visual, these are waves meeting in octaves, powers of two, tetra cube octa. And that creates maximum destructive interference. So waves in these geometry are frozen there, isolating charge, because the wave cannot change geometry or be released from its nest or it'll create destructive interference. So nature uses the tetra cube octa hex symmetries for charge isolation. It doesn't mean that the hex, the cube, the tetra are evil. But in chemistry, you use the tetra, the cube, and the hex to isolate charge. Frozen water, the honeycomb hex, 
preservation. So the part of your house where you want secrets and privacy and isolation, tetra, cube, hex, powers of two, the octave. This is introduction to the physics of architecture. And the part of your DNA that's hexed is a charged insulator. However, whenever Mother Nature wants to make life, she does the opposite. She uses pent, golden ratio, five ten-sided symmetry, every living protein, golden ratio, golden ratio, golden ratio, repent and be saved, okay? So <laughs> Mother Nature uses the golden ratio for every living protein because that is the opposite. That is implosive compression of charge and perfected charge distribution. And perfected charge distribution is an electrical engineer's definition of life. I repeat, perfected charge distribution is an electrical engineer's definition of life. And we're going there to, when we talk about fractality. So something is happening at the center where the two pine cones are kissing that's perfecting charge distribution, opposite of charge isolation. And the reason it works is golden mean ratio, which is the geometry of golden mean spiral, golden mean, golden mean, golden mean. So here are these waves adding and multiplying. Now this is the point where, <clears throat> where you need to understand how this geometry, remember this is the top-down view of 10 spirals of the golden mean, the top-down view of every living protein, the top-down view of DNA, the top-down view of hydrogen. And it's an electric pattern which is producing implosion. So here now, in short, is the principle which is the key to everything else we're going to talk about tonight. So I'm begging you, you need to understand this or nothing else is going to make sense, okay? This is a geometry that is allowing compression to become acceleration. I repeat, this is a geometry that's allowing the compression of charge. You can call it the ether, the quantum foam, the unified field, whatever you like. I call it charge. It's a compressible media that stores inertia, and rotation of charge is the only definition we have for mass and time. So this is the jello of which the universe is made, right? <laughs> okay. This is a geometry that allows these waves which are compressible. Charge behaves like a fluid. Electric field theory is, is hydrodynamic. It behaves like a fluid. Nassim and I agree on that. When the waves add and multiply by golden ratio in this nest, they add and multiply not just the wavelength. Here's wavelength A and wavelength B, they meet by golden ratio and produce wavelength C. Add and multiply recursively, constructively. They add and multiply not just the wavelength, but also the wave velocity. I repeat, they add and multiply recursively, not just the wavelength, but what's called the phase velocity of the wave, the speed of the wave. Think about that for a moment, because that's the, the key to everything we're going to talk about tonight. So some of that charge, that compressional wave, finds that the phase velocity is adding and multiplying recursively. It's called phase velocity heterodyne. And that means some of the energy that's experiencing compression is converted to acceleration. So some of the charge in this geometry, adding and multiplying the wavelength and the wave velocity, some of that charge compression becomes charge acceleration. And do you know what charge acceleration is called? It's called gravity. Any questions? It's quite simple. Einstein was quite clear that charge acceleration is not able to be discriminated from gravity. In fact, charge acceleration is gravity. It's quite simple. If you have a way to accelerate charge, that is called gravity. That is our definition of gravity. So this is the reason that gravity exists. And I'm going to give you lots of evidence and proof of it, but this is the reason gravity exists. It is the reason atoms have gravity because the inside is fractal to the outside. Implosive, non-destructive charge collapse. The nucleus is fractal to the electrons. 
by golden ratio, and that is the reason gravity exists. Yes, sir? Isn't it how gravity exists rather than the reason? Well, it, it, let us say that if the waves did not meet in golden ratio, gravity would not exist according to this hypothesis. So I'm going to present some physics evidence to back up my statement shortly. But the point of this moment is simply that you see why centripetal forces exist. If you know how this works, then you can see how fusion of plasma or charge could exist at the center. For example, why palladium, the heat of cold fusion, to think about it, and the sh uh, in the next lecture I'm going to do for the Astro Group, I'm going to present the story of the history of alchemy and how Shakespeare learned to write about the alchemy of people, how group mind exists, how fusion experience can happen among people in the origin of alchemy, because Shakespeare actually learned that from John Dee in Prague. And that is the story we're going to tell lots of fun of the next lecture on the 11th. But the point is, the possibility of the fusion of people or the fusion of plasma has the same symmetry operation right here. So once you understand how fusion is possible in general, all of which is explained by one simple symmetry operation, you can understand the origin of all centripetal forces. And again, we're going to get to the, the new equation I wrote for hydrogen, which is proof of this in just a moment. But first, pretty pictures. <laughs> OK, no. But so if, if you animate that spin path, this is this just little animation. But you see how magical that is? When I revolve that golden mean spiral down that cone, and it's this cone right here, dodeci cosa dodeci cosa. I revolve that spiral. I have the Holy Grail. And the Holy Grail is in the blood. And it's a three-dimensional fractal. And the inside is like the outside. And it contains the Sufi heart with wings, the feminine reproductive organs, <clears throat> the perfect valentine. And you could zoom in forever infinitely and always recursively see the same thing. And this is actually the nature of the electric field in the core of DNA which is how DNA radio works. It's called a phase conjugate di dielectric. It is the physics of the collective unconscious, truly, in my humble opinion. It's the physics of what Jesus called the communion of saints. We can describe that field. I recommend a paper to you. It's called Alice in Barium Titanate Land. It's about the nature of phase conjugate dielectrics. It's a gorgeous paper about the self-organizing nature of that electric field, and your DNA is making it. And if you understand it well, you can learn how to die correctly and get born correctly. It is actually instructions in the hygiene for birth and death, because you take that field with you. It's how ancestors travel in the plasma. I get over-enthused. OK, I'll slow down. <laughs> We're going to talk about physics tonight. We'll go into the metaphysics another evening. <clears throat> so if I revolve that cup, notice you see the swastika mapped to perfect compression. This is a three-dimensional fractal. And the only thing I've animated is this path down this cone of this three-dimensional fractal, dodeca, ecosa, dodeca, ecosa, dodeca, ecosa. I got the star mother kit. It's a model now. And it's precisely a model of the equation I wrote for hydrogen, which I'm going to show you right now. So there was some famous work in the literature showing that the radii of hydrogen were in golden mean ratio. There is a whole series of rather important uh, studies on the geometry of hydrogen by a famous scientist named Heyrovska. And he wrote a series of notes showing, and I have this hydrogen PowerPoint. Let me dig this out right here. This is the one I want. He wrote showing that the hydrogen radii, the nest, the Balmer series, <clears throat> and the other series in hydrogen, golden ratio, golden ratio, golden ratio, golden ratio. <clears throat> the most important in angst are 0 0.47, 0 0.6, 0.81, radii of hydrogen, golden ratio, golden ratio, golden ratio. He found golden ratio all over hydrogen. I thought that was cool, because I'd been studying golden ratio for my whole life. So I dug into it, and I did a little mathematics. And you know what I found out? Something that's tray cool. It's very cool. It's fun. 
And what I found out was that if you take the unit of length in physics, which is, <clears throat> see physics has a definition of sacred. You didn't know that, did you? Physics knows what wavelength and wave time is sacred. Physics is very clear. There's no ambiguity on the question. It's called the Planck length and the Planck time. It's like baby drool. It dissolves everything in the universe, right? <laughs> it's a universal solvent. Every wave in the universe divides evenly into Planck length and Planck time. It's quite clear. In fact, if you calculate correctly, you can derive the sacred for physics. And I do mean the sacred, which means resonant, actually. But that's another point. So I took, I, I intuited that the golden ratio radii of hydrogen must fit a black hole down to the level of Planck length. And sure enough, I did the inverse logarithmic function and I found out that Planck length times golden ratio, a precise whole number power of golden ratio produced precisely the radii of hydrogen. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's a perfect fractal black hole. The picture of the top of hydrogen is the pine cone working. That's what it's about. Now, I did a whole other series of calculations, which I have been persuaded to make some of that secret because commercially that's how we're doing in energy technology. But I wrote a whole other series of equations for the Planck time constant and golden ratio to show that I could predict a whole table of frequencies, which are key to the energy of hydrogen. In fact, I predicted the frequency that Kansius used for splitting hydrogen, <clears throat> the radio frequency. I predicted some, many of the frequencies that Meyer talks about and others. So we have this sacred table of frequencies, magic recipes for frequencies. And we're busily over in our little laboratory and we're zapping hydrogen. And here's how we're doing it. If you, and Ian was very helpful in building these, but if you take a radio frequency transmitter with the correct frequency recipe and invert and then use what's called polarized RF. Guess what you can do between them? You can phase conjugate and compress, implode, and split. Now there's lots to this because we can superpose this on a DC high voltage and we can superpose an audio frequency on the radio frequency. And I've gotten a little ahead of myself because I need to tell you a few other stories to make this understandable. You see, I started this work a couple of years ago and I built a device called a phase conjugate dielectric. And I took the audio equivalent of that frequency recipe and I played it to piezoelectric oscillators and created a resin. And when we, when we place that resin in this phase conjugating capacitor. Phase conjugate is a better word than orgon because electrical engineers have the potential to understand. It is a centripetal dielectric. Um, <clears throat> to get a little idea of what a weak form of a phase conjugate dielectric is, I'm going to pass these around. This is the reason that kings wear gold crowns. Because the construction of the crown, if it's proper, will actually accelerate metabolism and therefore accelerate mentation rate. That means if you think a shareable thought, you will radiate. That means if you think an unshareable thought, you will go nuts faster. <laughs> <laughs> you need to be part of a shareable wave and that's the electric definition of pure intention which is called coherence in wave theory and coherence perfected is fractal. So if you can join a perfectly shareable wave to think a shareable thought, then you can wear the gold crown. <laughs> now, in fact, to try this, I'm suggesting two things. You, you just play with it for a minute. When you get them, you very slowly move them to your ears like this. No, I'm hypersensitive. It really gives me the buzz. <laughs> but just try it. Move it very slowly, flat to your ears, and then slowly away. and see what happens to your aura, and then try the same thing here, yeah? Okay, just try it. This is a weak phase conjugate dielectric, and it's a metabolic accelerator. This electric field is the reason why when you plant seeds at Stonehenge, they grow faster. 
It's a very replicable, well-replicated experiment. We now understand the physics of how that electric field was made. Yeah, right? Get a little buzz, you know? <laughs> so, so this, I want to give you just a little piece of the history now. Um, I took these frequencies, which I derived from that equation, and I play them piezoelectric oscillator, and I made a resin, which I place inside of those, and then we do this study. <laughs> You're sensitive. That's good. That's good. Uh, some people don't get a lot. Some people get too much. So. Yeah. Uh, I, I wanted to show you the experimental setup. The experimental setup is basically we're measuring, we're proving that we create metabolic acceleration. And we take those cups and we place them on the side of a, um, of a laboratory container containing a fermenting yeast. And in fact, we find that we're able to cause growth acceleration. And I just wanted you to see what that looks like here. If I have pictures. Index relative. So I, we put that, here's, here's the resin crystals. And this is an example of a bioactive electric field. And when you put those resin crystals in the container, it does the same thing it's doing now, but it's more powerful. And when you put those, that capacitor on the outside of a jar in which there's fermentation happening, we did an extensive laboratory study and replicated it quite a few times. And we found <clears throat> we found that we could accelerate fermentation rate by about 40 to 50 percent. This is the rate of glucose consumption by an ultraviolet um, UV spectrophotometer assay where the presence of glucose without the gold cups on the side of the jar and with the gold cups on the side of the jar, the temperature was compensated and there was no power applied. So I have a passive capacitor that accelerates metabolism that much. Okay, And this means that the fermentation industry, beer, wine, yogurt, composting, digesters, that a simple coating can accelerate growth. Now, and that coating was made by taking the frequency signature I just told you about and causing a resin crystal during the moment of crystallization to assume that molecular geometry by a pair of piezoelectric triggers, uh, piezoelectric speakers, as it were. So we know how to make a crystal that causes growth. Now, let me just give you a little historical flavor for that. And then I'm going to give you a chemist's flavor for that. Here's the historical flavor. In the Bible, they say, well, I will build a Shem unto the Lord. And then <clears throat> that became, that word Shem became the word in the Bible. They translated that to mean the altar in church. So your altar in church, the name of that stone is called Shem. Actually, that's the Sumerian root of the term altar in the church. Now, Zachariah Sitchin spent many years studying the Sumerian word Shem, which became our word Shema. And that became our word scheme or matrix or plan. And later it became chem, which became chemistry and alchemy. So the word chem here is a very important little word. And when Zachariah Sitchin worked hard to translate the word chem, he finally decided to call it a highward fire stone, a fractal capacitor. So the historical story, we're going to tell more of this story in another lecture, but basically the Anunnaki came here, the Uru. Alpha Draconis culture via place. And when they arrived, they had a problem. The problem was they discovered they were aging prematurely. So they needed to build an electric field which prevented aging. And that electric field, in short, is called the Garden of Eden. So 
There's a lot of history to learning how to build a bioactive electric field. In fact, it's my uncle Hermes Enki that started this. You see, we call him Uncle Hermes. So that's the historical context. But now I'm going to give you the chemical context, bioactive electric fields. Remember, based on the same frequency signature of the fractality of hydrogen itself. The chemical context is something called redox potential. Do you know what redox potential is? Anybody been in your chemistry class? Ox oxidation reduction potential. <clears throat> in chemistry, there's something called <clears throat> biologic terrain analysis. And in, in biologic terrain analysis, you take any liquid in your body, you know, your urine or your, your saliva, <clears throat> and you measure resistance of the water, the liquid, pH, acidity, and you measure redox. If you measure those three things in, your, in the water in your body, you immediately know whether you have cancer or whether you have health. Simple. So to know if you've got cancer, redox is how you measure it, basically. And redox, oxidation reduction potential, ability to have oxidation reduction, is generally defined as electron availability to react. Now, another language for electron availability to react is charge distribution efficiency. Ooh, remember when I said electric? Yes? Could we, could we study uh, Yes, we're beautiful. That's exactly where we're going with this. Electric, electronegativity and the power of antioxidants. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you very much. Yes, exactly. So, redox potential is charge distribution efficiency. And you know what you call distribution efficiency in mathematics? You call it fractality. You know why you call it fractality? Because fractality is perfected compression defined. Infinite compression has only one form in physics. It's called fractal. But you know what perfected compression is? Perfect packing is perfect unpacking. So every time I say the word fractal, just imagine a rose. You've got the picture. Rose, fern, onion, pine cone. You can close your eyes. You can do fractal very easily. The inside is like the outside, <coughs> a fraction of the all, right? So that ability to compress perfectly is the ability to unpack perfectly, OK? And that is perfected charge distribution efficiency. So you measure whether the water's fractal to find out if you're alive or dead. Now. What would fractality in air be? Don't you think we need to know? Life or death for air? First, let me say that this ability to understand charge distribution perfected, just to give you a flavor for how fun this is, is because this understanding of distributing charge perfectly will then allow us to invent architecture. In my mind, architecture is not invented until you know how to make the electric field to cause life. If you don't, certainly your architect should not get a paycheck. I've been teaching that for 15 years now. We invented biologic architecture, and we lead the field of biologic architecture all over the world. We had 300 international professionals at our international conference in Mexico City three years ago, and then we did Cardiff, Wales. And we lead this all over the world. We teach biologic architecture. And this lecture is not about biologic architecture, but I'm going to tell you what it is. It's the ability to make the electric field that causes life. So if your architect built a building that causes a rose to grow, give him a paycheck. But if he didn't, don't. And if he built that building with steel and aluminum, the rose is not going to grow. So don't give that architect a paycheck. It's called biofeedback. Okay? You're going to understand, time we're done tonight, why steel and aluminum prevent your children from having a soul in their schools. That's what I'm here to tell you. Because your plasma, your aura, can't breathe through it because it's not fractal. It's not phase conjugate. It doesn't allow the breath of living plasma to pack and unpack through it. So if there's a metal roof, it isn't as easy to dream, you know? So example, this is a map of Bohemia, Prague. <clears throat> when we were there many times, we find it's much easier to lucid dream in Prague. Actually, I'm not a very good lucid dreamer, but I can even lucid dream in Prague. 
<laughs> now, the thing is, if you take the magnetic map of the area, you find it's a rose. This is actually the original magnetic map of Bohemia. Now, Bo means Enki and he means blood. <laughs> well, we won't go to the history part of the story until later. But, but the, 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 and the discovery of alchemy is about here. <laughs> John D. and Kelly and, and Shakespeare under his spy name, which is Francis Garland. They were all over there getting in trouble. Anyway, in the center of the rows, you have charge compression, charge distribution perfected. So the short summary of the story of what is architecture based on this physics is as follows. You go home and you run, do not walk, to get all the steel and aluminum out of your house, starting with your bedroom and your kitchen. Certainly the metal coil springs in your bed, which are killing you, because your aura can't breathe through them. And then what you do is you make a magnetic map, dousing, make a magnetic map of your bed, and your house and your city. And if they all look like a rose, you're in good shape. But if they don't look like a rose, you need to fix it, actually. This is, this is a short introduction to what is living architecture. So basically, the house needs to be located where magnetic lines cross in a fractal. And that introduces you to song line, dreaming track, which are measurable magnetically. And that is beyond the scope of this discussion. But I just wanted you to introduce you to the idea of why Bioactive electric fields are important because fractality in air, which is how you measure life, is actually measurable. And the guy who measured it, remember, I'm an electrical engineer sitting here telling you how to measure sacred space, right? And the guy who taught me to start with on this is my, one of my heroes, Dr. Konstantin Karatkov in St. Petersburg who invented the GDV, Gas Discharge Visualization System, which is a clinically documented Curlian technology where you take a high voltage fingerprint and by 10,000 medical studies, 10,000 medical doctors use this tool and they know which part of which fingertip is which gland by charge radiance. This density of capacitive discharge, sometimes called your aura <laughs> or your plasma field, will then be extrapolated in a computer map, like this person here has been sitting in front of the old-fashioned computer screen too long, and it burnt a hole in his aura. This is also a useful tool if your two teenagers are doing recreational drugs, because you can measure where the holes in their aura show up and show them how to do a little plumbing to fix the aura. <laughs> okay? Because this is what you take with you when you die. Very important. And by the way, he measured how to take it with you when you die. But that's probably not the subject of this evening also. <laughs> but at any rate, so he used this technology, which is basically measuring your aura. <clears throat> well, I'll show you just a little bit about that since I bring it up. <laughs> but you see, this ability of your plasma field to be propagated efficiently, it, it's a very simple concept that if you measure the number of hours it takes your aura to leave your body after death. And these were not volunteers because these people that were measured were dead. <laughs> uh, but they, and they used a morgue. But actually it's true that the number of hours it takes for your aura to leave your body after death is measurable and it corresponds to somewhat the Tibetan Book of the Dead. And in the German literature it's called Visela, the soul. And he's measuring where the plasma of your aura goes when you die. And the short answer to the question is, you need to die in a place that's magnetically fractal. In other words, the opposite of a hospital. <laughs> because your plasma needs some place to go. It's very simple. An aboriginal could tell you the Dreamline Songing Track is a magnetic river. It's very measurable. It's been measured. And that's where you go. That's why the magnetic map of your bed especially where you get born and die, needs to look like a rose because the plasma needs some place to go. And that's what it looks like. And this is what you see when you die. I'm just going to do this very briefly because this is a little bit beyond the scope tonight. But what you see when you die, you see a sequence of visions. It's been well studied. You see lattice, cobweb, tunnel, spiral, and then it starts over. The death visions geometrically are well documented. When I drive to Paris, I get a map. So when you die, I suggest you use the map. Seriously. And that's called the Clouvet form constant. 
And the reason that you see lattice cobweb tunnel spiral in that sequence when you die is because that's the braid sequence symmetry operations of DNA, to put it simply. In other words, your DNA is preparing you for implosive plasmic compression, which would then allow charge propagation efficiency. In other words, the voices of ancestors. So we have a lot on the web about that, and, and I wasn't really going to go into that a great deal tonight, but this idea that you can teach a hygiene for how to prepare for death by being an electrical engineer is something I would like to suggest to you, truly. Your ancestors, the Anunnaki, they went to the altar at Machu Picchu, but now we know electrically why. You can bring memory through birth and death if you do it correctly. And it's a very simple physics. And if we understood it, we would build our hospitals entirely differently, truly. And the sooner this information is taught, the sooner we can evolve as a species. And that's one of the reasons I'm here. At any rate, so bioactive electric fields are based on this simple science that when, where waves can be distributed, they can propagate. Now, I mentioned in passing This is uh, Rob Gourlay in Braidwood outside of Canberra, and he's measured the color and the white is magnetic flux permissivity, which is airplane and satellite map. And it turned out that these lines where there's extreme magnetic conductivity in the land correspond precisely to what the local indigenous aboriginal people called songline dreaming track. So it, it is our convention that Songline Dreaming Track is, in fact, a magnetic river, and that magnetic river determines where your plasma goes when you dream and when you die. It's also a pretty good indication of whether you will take memory through death if you can lucid dream. So I strongly suggest to you that you practice, and that is an electrical assignment. <laughs> um, th well, this was uh, air actually... Rob Goulet, they made big bucks <laughs> because what the, he, he built the software algorithm to reprocess re publicly available airplane and satellite maps of magnetic flux density to amplify the boundary conditions to see those white lines, actually. And in the process, they located water and resource and mineral and made big bucks. <laughs> And that was his company, one of his companies he sold. But the point is he became quite convinced of the reality of the songline dreaming track in the process. And that's instructive. And that physics of geobiology, geomancy, feng shui, is something that I've been teaching for 20 years. And we translate the leading geobiology schools of Europe in this physics. And that's, again, beyond the scope of this evening's conversation. <laughs> this is a bioactive electric field. It's sometimes called the Ark of the Covenant. It's a centripetal or phase conjugate dielectric capacitor. It's got a trace mineral rich acacia hardwood and a thin film of gold and the accurate geometry, which I believe is scaled to hydrogen and plug. And it's making implosive capacitance, a phase conjugating dielectric. There are many uses for this thing. One of the things they use it for is this spark here could be motorized, could use to motorize when you make monoatomic gold, ormes, the spice mana in the Bible. It was served in a round white wafer later called Holy Communion. But, but the physics of the process that made the gold atom stable as a mono atom is right here, the nature of that capacitor. And that was the cash cow of the Essenes. After Akhenaten changed his name to Moses, that's how they made their money. And they sold that to dead people. I mean, to people who were dying. <laughs> and they did this at Rennes le Chateau in South France. It was a full service necropolis, city of the dead. <laughs> anyway, but the point is, this is an example of the kind of capacitor we need to build using the proper electrical engineering. And now I'm going to show you some examples. I built um, a version of this called Purify Icosify. This is the Purify here. <clears throat> this is a... Um, This is a trace mineral hardwood. There's a special uh, dielectric shellac here. And this is gold, 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 and gold. And this is scale to hydrogen and plug. Now, in a, a, there's a larger version of this called Icosify, which um, uh, builds a similar electric field, which is actually even stronger. 
And these devices, here's the Icosify. There were 300 people that came to this conference in Barcelona here. And they, there was a long line of people wanting to have this experience in here. And it feels like you walk into the sacred stone altar of a sacred church and your hair stands up. It's a charge compression experience. In this environment, it's called a phase conjugate dielectric, and there's one of those gold eggs in every vertex, Ecosa dodeca. This is all gold, gold, and gold. And it's scaled precisely to hydrogen and Planck. It produces the electric field, which is this, a phase conjugate dielectric, which is implosive and centripetal. It's a metabolic accelerator. When we do it magnetically, it's, it's a pain reducer. And I could show you that. There's actually a study done at the FDA by one of the world's famous scientists, Elizabeth Rauscher, on pain reduction, phase conjugate magnetics. We don't have time for all this tonight. But in this device, in addition to producing met metabolism acceleration, and in addition to using it to charge rock powder, here's the, here's the setup. This is, this is a piezoelectric sand, uh, quartz calcite white fine powder, and it's being charged implosively in the centripetal dielectric, a pyramid. And if you take a little bit of that rock powder and put it in a muddy pond, the water clears up rather quickly. It also, when you put it on, on your seeds, the growth is dramatically faster. And there's a company in Germany that's famous for using that material. It's called Fokker.de. But they don't reveal the physics. We're teaching the physics of how this works. And this can be used for composting, digesters, etc. So this is an example of a bioactive electric field. And all of this is built on the same geometry and frequency signature. So <clears throat> this is a kind of charge implosion we're talking about. Now I'm going to move into some examples of how this might be applied technologically. First, to see if we did our homework right, I said to you that this geometry is the cause and the reason that life exists. And I, I would like you to see how that kind of plays out. If you, if you put your voltmeter at the top and bottom of a fresh chicken egg or pine cone, you will measure about 2 to 14 millivolts. And that electrical negativity is called life. And if your biology teacher doesn't know where that voltage comes from, they should not get a paycheck, actually, OK? Because that's how you make life, is you get fractal or get dead. That's our new bumper sticker. We use that on the get fractal or get dead. And, and so um, this ability to make this geometry is key to the nature of life. This is called projective geometry and etheric formative force in Steiner. And what Steiner meant by projective geometry was capacitive dielectric field symmetry. <laughs> and, by etheric formative force, he meant a weak centripetal electric field. So if, if, you, if you apply that to an egg, you get that voltage, 4 to 12 volts from the millivolts from the opposite end of an egg. And this is how you measure it. We dump it into a preamplifier that can amplify one millionth of a volt and spectrum analyze. And you can tell whether the chicken egg or anything is alive or dead if it organizes this weak electric field. It's a little bit more sensitive than the biophoton technologies. And, and that's how actually we would tune a Joe cell, incidentally. I am proposing that Joe cells be tuned with this exact technology with the same transducer, preamplifier, and spectrum analyzer, actually. And that I know the frequency signature to, to determine when the Joe cell is tuned because we know the harmonics that will make the dielectric centripetal. And I even, I even put a special slide here for this evening's conversation to try to help you get thinking about that. Ian wants us to be highly experimental tonight. Um, this is a famous zero-point nonlinear energy technology. I choose not to call it free energy because I believe that's an, uh, the wrong word. The energy clearly comes from the gravitational field, and it's not free. Thank you very much. In fact, the Atlanteans screwed up because they called it free. Right, OK. So, but in the CR device, where you gain power is in a square wave pulse. Like, imagine you were pulsing a Joe cell, or you were pulsing hydrolysis. If the collapse wave of the pulse 
was tuned so that the harmonics here, right there, were implosive. That's called perfect damping in physics. The new information is that when the geometry of that wave is perfected, in hydrodynamics class, the caduceus, this is golden ratio, and this is golden ratio. So your amplitude and your wavelength are changing by golden ratio. And in physics, this map of perfect damping, it, that's called, in your hydrodynamics class, is all defined by golden mean ratio. And this is Hermes caduceus. And this is implosive collapse. Now the new information is that if this is the path the charge is following, you will actually gain inertia during the collapse. That is the key to every single nonlinear and zero-point energy phenomenon, every single one. So if you understand how you gain energy during implosive collapse, you have the key to gravity energy, zero-point energy, implosion energy. Now I'm going to give you some examples. So we can take a frequency signature, spectrum analyze, and fix that wave to make implosive collapse around such capacitors, one of which is called the Joe cell, right? But I'm going to just show you another simple example from, see, I built a device called the imploder, which we do to water. We pass it through implosion hydrodynamically and then implosion magnetically, and we've achieved 30 to 200% growth effect replicably for agriculture, the imploder.com. And it's sometimes called Schauberger's dream. <laughs> and, and I'd like to show you why it's called Schauberger's dream. Let's see, sh slide number 72 in phase conjugation. I wanted to discuss with you one moment. I know there's many people here interested in the Joe Cell story, and I think there's a useful analog here. This is a, a rough approximation of a device that I saw at the Implosion Research Center in Plymouth, UK, Jonathan and Dolly. And they didn't do it quite right, but the inside of the cavity needs to be a phase conjugate dielectric material. A phase conjugate dielectric material thin film of the PGM metals, platinum group metals, platinum, palladium, or gold are good examples of phase conjugating dielectric. And that would be an idealized thin film membrane for the inside of the cavity. They did have a 50,000 RPM flap impeller in the one I saw. And in fact, like Victor Schauberger, the water in this cavity was piezoelectrically doped with a proper electric conductive material, an example of which would be probably a barium strontium titanate, but there are other piezoelectric dopants. Basically something makes it slightly conductive. The point is, if the angle of this cone is correct, and the inside of the cavity is a phase conjugate dielectric, and this is a lesson to the Joe cell people. Stainless will stand up to hydrolysis, but it's not the ideal phase conjugating dielectric material, actually. And the concentric radii of the tubes probably ought to be tuned properly now that we know the radii and frequencies more accurately. The point is that when Hitler wrote the check to pay Victor Sauberger because this worked as a generator to get voltage from gravity, the way that Schauberger and Hitler knew that this was starting to work was the moment it started spontaneously getting colder. The water spinning, suddenly gets colder. Sound familiar, Joe Cell people? Engine gets cold and freezes up, right? Fractality perfected compression is by definition the opposite of heat. That's going to be important when you study your Bible and read about the left behind. Here comes the rapture. Get ready for the rapture. How are you going to survive the rapture? I say, get fractal or get dead because <laughs> the solar wind is a compression event. Get it? If your neighborhood looks magnetically like a rose, you will not have a problem. You watch any good tornado, the big ones, the center's a pentagram, always. Good tornadoes, they will go out of their way to destroy a metal building. They do, because the metal building feels like pain, because charge distribution is not efficient there, and that defines pain. Whereas that good, intelligent tornado will go out of its way to save a stone church. Why? because that feels like the opposite of pain. It's a fractal. You see the difference? That is the basic instruction for how to survive the rapture, you biblical students, right? Okay, now that we've got that all sorted out. So here's this device. 
It's a centripetal dielectric. The angle of this cone, about 60 degrees, hint, 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 60 degree cone, implosion cone here, please kind of get in half. 50,000 RPM impeller. Now we get a voltage between here and here. Why do we get a voltage between here and here? Does anybody know? Why did that voltage show up between here and here? Electronegativity, defining life. Why did we get a voltage between here and here? Where is that charge going? Yes, sir. So the charge is dissipated faster from the larger diameter, and therefore the electricity escapes out of the top faster than it does from the bottom. If we had a top-down view of a pine cone learning how to kiss, the, char the waves of charge behaving like a fluid are adding and multiplying their phase velocities, and right here, they're finding a way out. Charge going through the speed of light, a black hole for charge, a fractal attractor for charge, the origin of all electronegativity, the charge has been accelerated through the speed of light called gravity, and so the electronegative, the electropositive, successful charge implosion fabricated the black hole which defines every electron. Th there will be a slight effect on the gravitational field, definitely, according to this. And in fact, this will then be a clue to how you would make a capacitor that causes gravity. Now, we, we're quite clear that it's very common to make capacitors that cause gravity. What's not clear is why and how it works. Basically, the attraction due to, to gravity for the Earth is similar to the atomic table. We don't have time to play the slides tonight, but if you look at the atomic table, the nucleus is platonic, and the electron shells are platonic nest. And you know that Chris Hiller wrote a whole bunch of beautiful papers on that here in Australia. And we have, there's a slideshow about that. Uh, we, we could go on a hundred tangents tonight. <laughs> but, but the inside to the outside of the atom is fractal, and that's how and why atoms make gravity, because, and only because, the nucleus is fractal to the electrons. And golden ratio rules. That's why atoms, like hydrogen, have and make gravity. If you understand that, then you can understand the Earth's gravity. Some people say that liquid iron core is dodeca. That's another question. Anyway, if you get more fractal than the Earth underneath you, you float. <laughs> it's called paying your debt to gravity. And examples of that are right here. This is a curved capacitor. And the curvature, if it's perfected, think grail cup, you produce thrust. Now, this is very common research. We know we can make thrust from negative ion wind. But what physicists are confused about is they say, oh, well, that's not going to work in a vacuum. But guess what? It does work in a vacuum. <laughs> and you know why? Because anytime you accelerate charge, you produce gravity. And the way you accelerate charge is by being golden ratio fractal. <coughs> I'll just give you one last example just to help you think about this. This is dedicated to your teenage son who wants to be a Jedi Knight. <laughs> this is called the raising of the Jed, the Jed Tower. This is a Jed Tower in the Egyptian tradition. And notice the geometry is based on golden ratio. And this was actually a stone tower where this angle of piezoelectric stone nested. The example is the nest of stones over the king's chamber in the Great Pyramid. This is producing a gravitational field that way which is taking the weight off the stone in the top of the king's chamber. Actually, my uncle Enki did this. And uh, so this is a jet tower, the raising of the jet. This is an example of a phase conjugating dielectric capacitor that's fabricating thrust. So it's clear that if you make electronegativity, you can make thrust. <clears throat> now, let's see, it's almost 9 o'clock. Um, and I was going to... Uh, quickly do the story of the origin of color and then uh, just summarize the hydrogen project briefly. But before I do, maybe a question so far. I know I've gone kind of fast, but please, yes, go ahead. Hmm? I just was wondering if there is anything in nature that doesn't have this Fibonacci. 
Yeah, I mean, it's true. It, you'd be hard pressed to find anything alive that doesn't have golden ratio. I mean, golden ratio, a nice way to understand golden ratio is to study Tai Chi. Now, in Tai Chi, you have something like an angle of movement that can gather charge. The charge is called the chi. Now, how, does the chi, how is the chi gathered? If you look at the geometry, here's the geometry. Here's golden ratio in your hand bones. Now, if you were an electrical engineer, ask the question of why the bones of your hand and your arm are based on golden ratio. They're designed to compress charge at a spark right there. And that geometry of that spark is illustrated here. And you can try this. See if you do this with me. When, when you move your hand like this, okay, but, but do it slowly and be aware that as you move your finger, you're also changing speed correctly as well. Now, if you do that correctly, you should notice something. What did you say? Involute. <laughs> It's an involute. Yes, it's an involute. It's the golden spiral. Um, but what you should notice is you should feel a little bit of tingling at the tip of your finger. Now, the reason the tip of your finger starts to tingle is if, if you do the angle correctly. Now, the quality of grace is called a calculus of curvature, where grace is defined as biologic charge. And the ability to gather charge is the quality of being graceful. <laughs> And the physics of the way you gather charge is called chi or yoga or sacred gymnastic. But the ability to know what angle of motion and that calculus of curvature changes speed and velocity precisely correctly to implode the charge right here. And that's that tingle of implosive charge compression. Literally sucking in charge, imploding. And that is the process by which you build your aura. And that's how you take memory through death. It's really quite simple. Any questions? And the, and the reason was that you needed golden ratio in the bone geometry in order for that capacitor to work, simply. And that's true of pine cones. Yes, go ahead. Question? Oh, you mentioned the air, uh, what would be in the air. Uh, uh, the ethna, how does the ether fit into what they used to? Originally, they said the ether, then they gave it away. Right. You know, the, the, the concept of ether is becoming more common in physics these days. And what I would say is I feel it's appropriate to imagine a universal compressible media, which I choose to call charge, which travels like a liquid. And that is analogous to what's called ether, actually. Charge, charge is like this. The compressible medium, when it's compressed versus rarefied, is called plus and minus charge. And that's what's called yin and yang. It's very simple. One is more centripetal and one's more centrifugal. So literally, that explains, for example, why the plus versus minus end of a magnet, one will increase pain and the other will dissipate pain. Because one's centripetal and one's centrifugal. Yes? Does your charge have consciousness? I would describe consciousness as the property that exists when the waves converge inclusively, recursively, and phase velocities accelerate through the speed of light, and you have a, a, a potentially infinite number of waves that converge. Uh, a way to understand that would be to notice the many measurements that have proven that focused human attention causes electric fields to compress. It, it's very clearly measurable. The book is called Conscious Acts of Creation by one of the world's most famous physicists, and I worked with him years ago, Bill Tiller, and he measured many ways that a focused human attention causes electric fields to compress. Now, it's less well known, but also true that focused human attention reduces radioactivity measurably, in the same way that phase conjugate dielectrics, like the Ark of the Covenant, reduce radioactivity, because it's a centripetal electric field. So that's, and that's actually a very appropriate question because I, and we'll demonstrate this at another event that I'll do, probably maybe the third event, but I invented a technology for measuring peak perception. 
consciousness. And my technology is called the Bliss Tuner, and I do a two-channel cross-hemispheric EEG brainwave power spectra, and I wrote software that illustrates when you have golden ratio, golden ratio, golden ratio in your brain waves. And this is a lady having an intense bliss experience. And so when you measure golden ratio in brain waves, that's how you measure enlightenment or peak perception, actually. Actually, the leading bank in Melbourne, ANZ Bank, is using this system in the EKG part of it to teach empathy. But in the cultural breakout program, ANZ Bank in Melbourne, they bought my system to teach their bank managers how to get in the same wavelength as their clients. But that's, that's for the EKG work. Um, but the same technology, the preamplifier, it does brain waves. Yes, but I, I present this as evidence that golden ratio phase conjugation is the reason that perception exists. Your right hemisphere and your left hemisphere learn to make the two pine cones kiss. And the plasma becomes centripetal, and you call that consciousness. And another neuroscientist has recently joined me and agrees that phase conjugate mirror principle is the cause of perception. Yes, question. Just to go back to something you said before that I want to change. Um, you mentioned about the rapture. Um, first of all, the first part of the question is where would I find references for that in the Bible? Uh, <laughs> if I wanted to start it. Yeah, you know, um, the concept of rapture is very common in, among fundamentalist Christian. But I, I, I am not a student of the Bible at all. But rapture is basically the idea that many Christians talk about having to do with the end times. In my view, rapture, like ecstasy, means a moment of intense charge compression. And that only structures and ideas which are implosive will survive. And all other structures will experience heat. That would be my... When you said, you mentioned survival rapture. Yes, I, I did. Um, my view would be to, to, to do this as a solar scientist, and we do lectures on this as well, but basically that the solar maxima, which is happening now as we speak, um, is triggered in part because of uh, the uh, something related to the galactic super wave that Paul LeViolette writes about, where the, the dust particle density from the current alignment with the galactic core puts more centripetal pressure on the solar system. The sun responds with a solar max event, which is happening now, which, you know, intense solar wind, responsible for a lot of anomalies, which, in my opinion, they're going to increase very rapidly, even in the next few months, and it will be very survival-related. And all of that phenomena can be described, in general, as a compression event. So in surviving the rapture, you're talking about physical survival? I'm talking about that living memory, which is defined as circulating charged plasma, will require fractality, definitely, yes. It would be my view that <laughs> one way to prepare is to, is to be in an area where the magnetic field looks more like a rose, definitely, yes. And if you're not, what, the, what then happens to you? The same thing that happens to metal buildings during tornadoes, that there will, be, you know, cities that are built of steel and aluminum in a square grid are going to be the first to die. Would be my to oversimplify. Yes. In in both senses that the the weather anomalies and the nature of high pressure storms and magnetic storms and solar storms, all of these phenomena, in general, will destroy first the square metal structures and leave the biologic rose-shaped structures. Yes. And, and a very simple example of that would be that you create your own microclimate if you do a lot of magnetic field work around your property to create a little charge bubble. You make a labyrinth, a stone circle, you know, and, and we do a lot of that work in advanced geobiology, and eventually people notice that you have your own microclimate. And on a large scale, that's an introduction to how, how to survive the solar wind, in my opinion. Another way to say that is, is and, and Ian might say that we're beyond the, the subject of tonight's would that have anything to do with fire? Yeah, yes, to yes. That 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 flame is the is is basically a name for what is implosive compression. So you know when you hear that Daniel walked through the flame, what actually is meant is that in the same way that the Brown's gas doesn't burn your finger, 
The reason your finger doesn't burn in the Brown's gas hydrogen is because that is an intense phase conjugate dielectric. And your tissue, if you're reasonably healthy, is phase conjugate material. So it can withstand implosive collapse without heat. However, you know, uh, steel or aluminum is the opposite to phase conjugate. And the way you measure that is harmonic inclusiveness. And so the steel and aluminum will be burnt. So, and so, so this was the, what they say about the mud. Unless the dream spell of the old ones is live in awake in symmetry space, Earth will be blown away in the magnetic wind of the sun. What they mean by dream spell is the fractal field generated by coherent emotion. Next question, someone else? Yes, uh, go ahead. Oh, well, they call it the rapture. They call it the rapture, but really what they mean is, I think what they're explaining is the ascension into the higher dimensions. And then this is because of the raising of consciousness. So uh, what would you say by raising your consciousness? Can For you use this technology to raise consciousness? Yes, but I think that it would be good to have some electrical engineering to have the conversation. So I would first define ascension, which the way I define ascension is quite simple, that when the, see, a little bit of background here, that I pioneered the work with Glenn Ryan when we first measured the fact that coherent emotion causes DNA to braid. So you can measure the effect of human bliss and love on DNA by simply measuring the tendency of DNA to, to braid or embed or recursively nest. I was looking for that slide here. It is my view that the way you predict whether an electric field will cause a seed to germinate is you measure the center of the capacitor for harmonic inclusiveness called fractality. And if the harmonics are inclusive there, charge distribution is efficient and you predict seed growth. Inside steel or aluminum, you have the opposite. You have a harmonically exclusive cavity and therefore an aluminum or steel box will kill living things. For example, your children in school, if that's a steel or aluminum building. And so I vote that you avoid that. So, um, so harmonic inclusiveness or non-destructive charge compression or fractality predicts which field effects support life. And steel aluminum structures prevent life because they prevent that charge distribution from being efficient. Interesting. I, I, that would be uh, my view. Would be that would yes. My view that would be that would be measurable by spectrum analysis of the weak capacitance at the center, and that if it begins to saturate, the field will begin to implode anyway, perhaps. But in my view, aluminum is a lousy way to start. But that's just my humble opinion. But if you look at the health records of aluminum foil factories, you begin to get an idea what homeopaths say about aluminum. It's it, that's right. Thank you. Thank you. So this is this is a, an example of measuring the effect when you have coherence in your EKG, the power spectra, the percentage of the enzyme that causes DNA to braid recursively goes up. So your DNA as a living slinky helix, oh, I hit my slinky helix, oh, here it is, thank you. That the DNA as a helix recursively braids, embeds, or nests in the presence of love, human bliss. And so what I believe is happening is that when there's phase discipline between the short wave embedded in the long wave, the braiding of the, the nesting, which happens when you have lots of bliss, your DNA becomes implosive by recursive braiding. And that's called getting a soul. And the way that shows up in the harmonic analysis of your DNA is that the frequencies climb this ladder. And, the, the, and the way, one of the ways we measure that happening is, is my heart tuner invention, which At the moment you feel love, generally, the presence of the higher frequency shows up in your EKG. Let's see if I can show you that more clearly here. So this 
presence of these higher frequencies in your EKG, which measurably causes those same higher frequencies to become coherent in your DNA, is called ascension. In other words, that coherence, that phase discipline, increases the number of harmonics present and the number of axes of superposed rotating charge nesting and symmetry, which defines dimension, means that you have ascended. <laughs> in other words, the, the bumper sticker in Sedona, ascend already, we need the space, essentially means, <laughs> means get fractal, because that does create space, and that's very feminine. But at any rate, all I'm saying is here, you can give some electrical engineering meaning to the New Age woo-woo, and when you, what you translate out of that is a hygiene. And that hygiene means move to nature, do the yoga, eat live food, learn how to breathe, eat live enzymes. Everything you do that grows your aura, that absorbs charge, is helping you. And everything that weakens your aura, like metal cars and metal cities and bad air and forgetting to breathe and dead food and fried food and, and hanging on, thank you, hanging on to your stuff. <laughs> but you get the flavor. You could take a whole electrical engineering view and translate it to hydrogen. I'm sorry, hygiene. <laughs> and that's what we wrote this book about for kids. The book was, you know, dear kids, we, your adults, realize that the only definition of culture is if we adults know how to teach kids how to have bliss. If you know how to teach your teenagers how to have a bliss experience, that's called culture. Everything else is culture, actually. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> it doesn't speak very well for France either, I'll tell you. <laughs> but, so culture is the skill to teach a bliss experience. So that means your engineers need to know how to describe bliss, and that's what this book is. That basically, you know, ritual, etc. So. Your children were willing to risk their lives in order to have bliss. And now we medically know that that's the way you get an immune system and that's the way you take memory through death, by getting that kind of charge. So a hygiene for bliss is designed with science. And it's everything religion used to be, minus the miracle worship and personality worship, which was all poison anyway. Yes, sir? So actually, ancestral memory is the plasma of the collective field of DNA finding how to circulate. And that happens in a fractal. And so there, you know, real ancestral memory is a library of survival information based on symmetry. And that gets into origins of alphabet and how DNA absorbs charge, which is the origin of alphabet, and beyond the subject for tonight. I think there were some things that Ian wanted us to talk about, and it's getting late. One of them was hydrogen. <laughs> but thank you for caring so much, really. And very good point. Y yes, go ahead. Scientifically, how would you explain uh, emotional clarity and maybe an event if you're doing past life depression work for healing to respond to Yes. In the same way that you would measure gradually as a Joe cell became phase conjugate dielectrically, you know how Alex describes the three stages of tuning? In my view, that is a conjugating dielectric field, eliminating the symmetry electrically at center, which does not allow implosive compression. So gradually, as you have more bliss experience, what you find is you get very still, you kind of feel that field that's 
kundalini, really. And then you spit out some mucus, and you take a pee, and you take a deep breath, and then you do that again. And gradually, the liquid crystal of your body becomes more implosively conductive, and you're closer to kundalini. And the biomechanics of kundalini are something I spent a lifetime studying, but they're beyond the scope of this evening's discussion. But clearly, the, the implosive compression, which is a phase conjugating dielectric, increasing in plasma density corresponds to the intensity of the bliss. Practical example, a good druid ritual blows the doors off the temple because the air pressure in the side changes because. You get where I'm going with this? Yeah. So hydrogen. We were supposed to have that conversation about hydrogen. So how are we going to turn this into a technology? That's the question of this evening. So I'm going to describe briefly now the technologies. We, I reviewed with you gravity, perception, but we didn't do color. Oh, just, just two minutes because it's so beautiful. That's all. Just two minutes because it's so beautiful. Look, do you know why rainbows exist? Would you like to know? Did, did you know that rainbows only happen in fractal air? Did you know that the air has to be fractal or you won't see a green flash? What is fractal air? Well, now we know it's measurable. So what is the physics of rainbows? Why does color exist? Well, very simply put, here's the physics. The photons, like everything in physics, travel as donuts. Seven color map, right? Now, color is only perceived in the cone in your eye. Electrical engineers know that there's only one thing you can use a cone for, and that's to measure the tilt or phase angle of the approaching electric field. So it is self-evident, according to any electrical engineer, that if color is only perceived in a cone, that color is the phase angle or tilt of the photon. Obviously, the photon is not a two-dimensional wave. No, the photon is a three-dimensional wave packet and all three-dimensional wave packets in physics, period, are donuts. So the photon is a donut, and the angle of the donut is called color. Now, if you notice that the visible spectrum, almost precisely one octave, is the move from the inside to the outside of one donut. The donut is quantized, the photon is quantized by Planck. And so the size of the donut called photon is quite constrained. So if you know the size is constrained and the visible spectrum is very accurately an octave, then you know how the donut goes from red to green to blue and ultraviolet. So If you say the most logical thing to believe that the visible spectrum is one octave and therefore one 80 degree rotation of a donut, and there's almost no other way to model that phenomena, then the zero degree rotation, uh, oh, this would be a way to model it. I'm sorry. The red is centripetal, the green is perfectly balanced, and the blue is centrifugal. So this progression from 0 to 180 degrees of rotation of a donut is called color. And if you plot the nanometer distances precisely of the primary colors and convert that to angular measure from 0 to 180, it is amazing. You get. 90 degrees for green precisely, in precise linear fashion, and 45 degrees is orange, and 135 degrees is precisely linear violet. So there's only two other angles here, which are precisely linear, predicted by yellow and blue. And then we have the entire rainbow based on the simple geometry of nesting donuts. 45, 90, 135. Obviously, this is cubic. Perfect. And we now know that green is the angle at 90 degrees when a photon approaches every living plant 
at 90 degrees angle, green, the plant goes, oh shit, I can't eat that, and spits it out. And that's why every living plant is green, because the angle of 90 degrees is opposite to phase conjugate. It's evil. It cannot be absorbed. And therefore, every living plant is green, because that is the angle of the photon which the plant cannot absorb. So it fits the physics very well. But the only mystery here is now why is 63 and 117 degrees the other angles making yellow and blue? Well, I was the first one to notice that 63 and 117 degrees is the internal and external face angle of a dodecahedron. Hello, it's this angle right here. 63, 117, right here. Face angle of a dodecahedron. In other words, the photons are doing this. They're making a dodeca. And you know why? Because phase conjugation by golden ratio is the reason color exists. That's why the waves are sorted. When the photon approaches the center of a dodecahedron, you get fusion, implosive compression. And that's why the waves of the photon are sorted. And that's the reason rainbows exist. Any questions? Something Goethe didn't know. So now you can replot all of your information about using color to heal because you can produce fusion precisely. I have given you the clues to the universe. If you want to take them and use them, go for it. Question. Does the diamond now replace the photon in the... Say again? Does the diamond now replace the photon in the particle? Um, well, I'm saying the donut is a wave packet called a photon. So in my view, there is no such thing as a particle ever, never has been. There's only been packets of waves. And the idea of particles is ridiculous, actually. And billiard balls were never real. <laughs> we got waves. That's all we got. My, the role of mind among waves is what we need to understand. <laughs> we are a wave, but that's fun. It's okay. <laughs> all right. Well, the spectral emission lines of hydrogen obviously are well plotted, but that's what we derive with Hayrovskis' work to see golden ratio. Right. Balmer series. In other words, <laughs> we, we have in our laboratory the precise frequency recipe, sonically, ultrasonically, radio frequency, and optical, or hydrogen. And you can squeeze that either way, you can get that from the curve. You can write schematics for that, and you can create some templates for your hydrogen. And you could beam a laser into the center of a water vortex. And if you got the phase angle right, and I have to credit Alex, he's speaking of that as well, it, it's real. And we know the phase discipline with which to do that. And they can all conjugate. The point is that phase conjugation inherently is broad spectral. That's why you, when you have bliss, start to steer tornadoes. What's that storm coming to Queensland? Yeah, well, we've got rid of that. So basically what we're saying here is that if enough of us enter that program, And, and that's an introduction to high order magic and Ophain and Enochian and angel calls. And hydrogen and fuel. And hydrogen and fuel, thank you. And it's all plasma science, actually. Right on. Yes, so we could get advanced here, but we, we promise to be gentle this evening. <laughs> so, um, in terms of technology, I will give you a couple of examples, and then this will be kind of in closing. So, I worked at this in terms of what I call the imploder, and I took that equation for. Uh, the geometry of implosion, and I converted that in CAD CAM <clears throat> Remember what we're saying. We're saying this is precisely the angle of implosive collapse. That is optical. That is dielectric. That is hydrodynamic. That is water. That is air. That is everything that anything that's gaining energy during collapse is going to do it only and in precisely that geometry. And that's going to be the scale, I'm sorry, that's going to be the ratio. And the scale is going to be Planck and Golden Ratio and Hydrogen. 
So now we know both the ratio and the scale, the key signature of global scaling, obviously, which is gold, golden ratio. So I spent two years in CAD CAM and built this based on that, basically. So I started with the hydrodynamics of this thing, and I built an injection molding technology. <clears throat> so I showed you the animation before you saw that shower nozzle, how the ponytail is gorgeous. So I've got the water that comes out of this. It's centripetal and implosive and silky and becoming self-aware, in the sense becoming recursive. But then I did one other thing. I combined that with what's called phase conjugate magnetics, which is something I invented. And in phase conjugate magnetics, this is, this is the north pole, and that's the south pole. And here, the two north poles are attracting. Now, normally I carry this with me, but I didn't do it on the airplanes to Australia. But those are the light poles held together. The two light poles are attracted here. And the angle of the, of the flux lines between them here makes a cone, which is pine cones kissing, phase conjugate magnetics. And that is a centripetal Z-pinch for magnetic flux lines. Now, I take a form of that, and I dump the output of my implosive cone into an array of nine gaps here of very, very strong phase conjugate magnetics. So I've, I'm motorizing a centripetally spinning, and the direction of helicity is critical. It's an antiomorphic, you know, up the down staircase. <laughs> and, um, and so the water molecule, by rotating, enters a magnetic Z-pinch, and out the other end, we call it imploded water. It's experienced. The, the fact that the water is spinning as it enters the intense magnetic Z-pinch means that the molecular cluster size is drastically reduced. Here is a measurement of the effect on the charge radiance of the water. Here is a measurement of the entropy of the water. And here is even the first series of trials we did, we got 328% increase in growth in this plant by just feeding the imploded water. The molecular cluster size is so small, the solubility is way up, bioavailability, absorption, et cetera, et cetera. And so that technology has actually become commercial, and the brochure for the imploder is with what, was, what Ian handed you at the beginning of this course. And that imploder technology, you can read about it at theimploder.com, and it enables us to do other things because we are combining that with other growth technologies, which we'll talk about later. But you see, the combination of effects enables that water molecule to be stable as a monomolecule. The same way the gold atom became stable in a phase conjugate dielectric, the ormies, the spice, the mana. What I can tell you we've measured so far, we measured, uh, we're measuring surface tension. We had success in measuring, we had a dramatic reduction in chlorine gas. We eliminated chlorine virtually from the water. That's been measured in the lab tests in Thailand. Um, another test that has happened is that we, used, we made a special form of this for diesel fuel. And the first very careful trials, we had 7 to 10% increase in efficiency. Um, we are in the process of designing um, to use this frequency signature we're applying to hydrogen with Ian here in the hydrolysis project. We will also be doing that around the fuel line because as we, as we cause the hydrogen bond to unpack, we can unpack all of the hydrocarbon energy. So there are many additions to this that we're right in the process. Of. So we're just at the beginning of having fun with this. But the point is at this moment we have, oh, there's quite probably uh, dozens of measurements of uh, the effect on plant growth. And so we have some commercial momentum already because our agricultural results are compelling already. The fuel effects uh, were at an early stage of measurements. And you've got smaller designs for your 
We, we are using one of the strongest magnets available commercially, especially made in China, actually, and rescaling to other sizes is complicated, expensive, in other words. But I would just point out that I pointed out the fact that the seed at Stonehenge grows better. This is the book. You, I recommend this book, Seed of Knowledge. That if you have a stone, a circle of stone dolmen, you can replicably measure the fact that this has a dramatic effect on growth. And you really should ask your, yourself the question of why is it that a circle of the right kind of stones affects seed germination? Because when you start to think about that, then you can begin to think about the physics of what is a fractal field. And that's where we're going this evening. So at our lab here now, um, actually one of several labs we have, we have assembled uh, in several places um, some uh, equipment, et cetera. We have a um, gigahertz uh, spectrum analyzer. We have a two-channel uh, uh, arbitrary waveform, 30 to 50 megahertz uh, signal generator. And we are doing a spreadsheet trigonometry to superpose up to five to nine harmonics in precise recursive heterodyning golden ratio in the precise frequency signature to fabricate the complex waveform envelope to phase conjugate that wave down into the level of hydrogen. And, you know, Kansius and Stan Myers, they, they all had critical frequencies, and it just happens that this equation that I built um, predicted those frequencies, like the 10,000 that Myers used and the uh, 30 uh, megahertz that um, Kansas used. Pardon? Um, we published part of this on the web. The, radi the, the equations that I wrote for hydrogen are um, at goldenmean.info slash goldenproof. And there you will find the radius equations in detail. The frequency equations uh, some of the details have been removed because we have to have some excuse to pretend we're commercial about this. But Ian can tell you more, and we're looking for other partners in this project. But I want to say one more thing about the frequencies. This uh, article on the frequencies is goldenmean.info slash coincidence. And I, I just want to say, I, this is something to meditate on as you go to sleep tonight, if you will. But if, if you take the Planck time and accurately use this equation as I did, not only did I predict this whole nest of frequencies of hydrogen and Kansius and Myers, but Planck time times golden ratio precisely predicts not just hydrogen, but it predicts the duration of the solar year of the Earth. And it predicts very precisely the duration of the Venus year. Now, I would like to show you an animation of the geometry of the Venus orbit so you can begin to get an idea of this. Because what I'm trying to explain to you is that time, like space, only emerges from chaos when it's fractal. And the fractality in time, that's, see, in other words, we, we remove part of the equation because we're commercializing that. But here is the geometry of the orbit of Venus. Isn't that pretty? Isn't that romantic? The retrograde recursive orbit of Venus, not only is it at fractal pentagram, but it is precisely this. So here is golden mean ratio in the planetary orbital radii and time. Now remember, time is a name for the period of rotating charge. So I told you that charge rotating stores inertia, and that's the only definition we've ever had for mass. Charge rotating has period, and that's the only definition we've ever had for time. So don't let these people tell you that time is an illusion. It is not. Rotating charge is not an illusion.
However, you can travel in time if you accelerate phase velocity through the speed of light by golden ratio, which is what the planets are doing. Another way of saying this is you can plot the key event history of your life just like we did for the Maya. Here is the Mayan calendar. And here are, here is the interval. This is Joff Stray's book. I worked with him beyond 2012. And here is the Mayan calendar divided by golden ratio, a fractal in time. So the point is that if you plot event histories to fit golden mean spiral, you create the embedding of charge circulation which is the only definition of the physics of coincidence. You want miracles in your life? This is what you study. Fractality in time is a beautiful thing to study, and it's a rose. Golden ratio, on time, hydrogen, Earth year, Venus year, Mayan year. It's all one large rose. Why? Because charge transfer is made efficient. And that's the physics of coincidence. Now, this is getting advanced and esoteric, and we're going to stop now. But I just wanted to give you this little introduction to the physics of time. You see? Phase conjugation and how do we merge from chaos. And I'll tell you one more thing. This is just a little bit exciting, but I'll just tell you. We wrote a proposal for computer software to analyze the stock market to predict when it was emerging from chaos. And by the way, the movie Pi was based on my story. <laughs> and, and the movie Chain Reaction is based on Ian's story. <laughs> no, but we wrote that software program, and the Dubai group has actually funded that, and we're actually writing that code. It's real. Because you can identify when any living oscillator is going to emerge from chaos. Perfect damping. That wave shape. And there are techniques in spectrum analysis to reveal that. So you can tell when anything is going to emerge from, us, from chaos. Let me give you one last example. And par pardon my enthusiasm, but this is fun, so it's okay. But the, the last example I'm going to give you is, um, is it's called fertilization. That if, if you model how a living egg is fertilized, now can I find this animation? Um, there's something called the seven stages of invagination. And the, the electric wave, which allows... I have three keynotes open. Bear with me. Um, but the, how to think about this. If you look at what a sperm, what's, here's the thing to meditate on. What service does a sperm do to an egg? This is going to be an introduction to romance this evening, right? You, you wanted that this evening, didn't you? No. But the service that a sperm does to an egg, in short, could be called dimpling. And what dimpling is, I have this beautiful little series of pictures about this. It's really sort of cute. So, so here's Mr. Sperm and here's Mrs. Egg. And this is a delivery of compressed capacitance. What you need to know, and this is essential information, is the egg is infinitely more fractal than the seed. So basically, guys, you're in trouble. I'm sorry. But in terms of distance from immortality, the egg's got it all over you. Because her mother's 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 egg was whole inside her mother's mother's mother. And that's called fractal, right? So that, and the nature of that folded surface is how you find mitochondrial Eve, et cetera, et cetera. Anyway, so the sperm is delivering a capacitive wave. And if Mr. Sperm has enough charge, then Mrs. Egg will dimple. And the onset of that dimpling determines if the geometry of the capacitive wave is recursive. I met some ladies had intense kundalini, and they had babies with no sex. I'm serious. I know. And I know exactly how the voltage caused the egg to split. It's not a mystery. Hello? No. The capacitive wave causes this to dimple and turn inside out. And that's called the seven stages of invagination. And if you look, when you drop an ink drop in water, if the water is sacred, the ink drop will actually self-organize and divide into exactly seven smaller donuts codified by the seven spins of the tetra. This is a long story, and it's called the seven stages of invagination. But the point is that the ability of that electric field to recur and cause that 
invagination process is an example of the turning inside out of self-organization. So talk about self-organization. The geometry of that electric wave that caused that sphere to decide to dimple, to turn inside out, you know? I would turn inside out for you, darling. <laughs> now, we could carry on here, but I think I'm going to defer to questions at this moment. Questions, comments? Yes, sir. Since we're the Association for Climate Technology, would you like to give a summary of the present state of climate change and how you see it? Um, <clears throat> my view of climate change, I wrote up at a web article called goldenmean.info slash fractality, not carbon. And it is my view that it is not appropriate to blame carbon. That's clear. In fact, carbon is not even a pollutant. Um, carbon or carbon dioxide? Carbon dioxide or both, actually. Um, no, what is clear is that um, only fractality allows wave systems to emerge from chaos, and that's especially true of climate. So um, now in that article, I worked with a a uh, climate scientist for the UN named Peter Taylor, and he had shown that the carbon plots, which allowed them to think that carbon dioxide was related to heat, were um, only the short-term time histories. And if you took much longer time histories of the temperature of the planet versus the carbon dioxide climate, this is the book Peter Taylor, I work with him. He was with the UN. His book is called Chill, a Reassessment of Global Warming Theory. And the short term CO2 to temperature makes you think, oh, it's CO2. But if you take that same thing in the long term, you get an entirely different view. And so it's clear that the carbon dioxide story is really kind of dumb, <laughs> actually. Um, so. It's my view that it's very normal for our solar system to have an intense solar maxima, and um, that it's also very normal for the culture here to have a kind of near-death experience during a solar maxima, actually, and that preparing for a solar maxima is not about reducing carbon, no, but it is about preparing for intense solar wind, actually. And good practice for intense solar wind there are several groups I work with, and I get the sense that there's some here in Melbourne that actually steer tornadoes shamanically. And as a scientist, we think we understand some of that science, actually. But steering tornadoes is pretty good preparation for solar wind. And I would like to show you a chart that was made in terms of preparing for solar wind and climate change. And that chart shows that on about, I think it was 11 different occasions, How did I click the wrong button? <laughs> On 11 different occasions, um, it was measured that, <laughs> if you plot the number of sunspots over the days before a global peace meditation when basically a million children sang the same song, and this is what happened to the solar flares. This is average of 11 different events. And this is uh, one of those events. So clearly, when a million children sing the same song, the sun goes, ah. The physics that's interesting is why does the sun go, ah, when a million children sing the same song? And I believe it's related to the fact that focused human attention reduces radioactivity measurably. Because radioactivity is the opposite of fractal. That's why a fractal field reduces radioactivity like the Ark of the Covenant did. And that's what the Anunnaki used to store their nukes. So the ability to inhabit the sun is actually consciousness. But consciousness specifically in the scale of a large-scale plasma event. And participating in large-scale plasma events is an introduction to some things which are not, which are beyond the scope of this tonight's conversation. But uh, group work and there's something called the Ophanum Enochian uh, plasma science angel calls. Uh, uh, you know, how a shaman steers a tornado 101. And I think we will kind of do that story in the next lecture. But it's my view that practically 
to prepare for this year. I don't think it's next year. I think it's this year. That's my humble opinion. You, if you're asking me, you're not going to have to wait till next year for the drama. It's this year. And my opinion is you need to move to high ground, shelter from high, high wind and high water, and community, and probably away from most big cities, actually. You need access to groundwater and seeds, and I think it's going to get messy. That's my opinion. It's, but It's tomorrow if you live in Cairns. Yeah, it's tomorrow if you live in Cairns. But, and, and also, this is an incredible opportunity to evolve because that, that magnetic flux density prevents, presents immense opportunities for intense bliss experience where your aura can grow very quickly. So there's a big line of people wanting to incarnate now even though it's getting messy. Yeah, but really, it wouldn't be efficient to leave because the best time in a schoolroom is when things get messy. Well, I do think it's complicated. Clearly, it's proven they're using aluminum particles and they're doing some, you know, anthrax and other vaccines. It's pretty messy. I mean, the chemtrails are a serious threat to your immune health. There's no question about that. It's reason number 10,089 why you need to move out of the big city, actually. Well, it's true, but there are, I mean, we live in the lowest population density in Europe, in South France, in the Pyrenees, and we have the best air, water, and magnetism in, the, in Europe, really. And even, I'm not saying that place is perfect, but it's an example, you know, and I, there's lots of places, but I, I think the big cities are a bad choice for the next short period. That's my opinion. Have you heard of the Oregon Rainmaker and the company in Singapore that makes them very rain engineering? I've just come across them. The angle of the cone Trevor Constable used in weather engineering on the high seas, the cone capacitor most likely to make rain was a 60 degree cone, which is this cone. That tells you something. It's a centripetal dielectric. And the physics is simple. If you ever watch a child, a child who's barefoot and having fun is usually able to put a hole in the cloud by focusing on it. The physics is they provide a centripetal field that seed of that field is what teaches the water vapor to form a droplet. So the likelihood of water vapor forming a droplet depends whether the ambient electric field is centripetal. And one example of that is when you focus in a cloud and put a hole in it. A very simple physics, actually. Do you know what Trevor's cones were made of or coated or anything like that? Um, he was using the classic orgone kinds of material. We now know much more about the physics there. I think orgone is the wrong word. Phase conjugate dielectric is a better term. Um, the alternate layer of uh, organic and inorganic material, we now know why the physics is that every organic molecule, when it became part of life, decided to join the club by getting fractal. So the molecules in what we call organic material have rearranged their symmetry to be more fractal and thus breathe charge, and that makes them a phase conjugating dielectric. So the alternating layers of organic and inorganic material in orgone material could be optimized clearly by using the more bioactive dielectrics like hemp fiber in the, in the organic insulating layer, and then in the, in the conductive layer, obviously, the phase conjugating dielectrics, barium, strontium, titanium, and in the conductors with the platinum group metals, gold, palladium, platinum would be ideal. But then the geometry of those should be rearranged to be recursive based on these equations specifically. So we know precisely what geometry to make the perfect implosive capacitor. It's not subjective, very tunable. And we can use a very precise electrical engineering language. James DeMeo is a sweet guy and I like him. He's done a lot of good, but he's very stubborn about using electrical engineering language. Yes? Uh, but, you know, I do think, and even as Ian points out, that the concentric cylinder idea, the fundamental insight of the Joe cell, is actually useful. And in general, you produce a more energized hydrogen than the flat plates. It's clear. But the reason you do is because that dielectric is conjugate. And I am suggesting a very precise physics involving spectrum analysis and modeling the geometry of those cylinders accurately to increase the centripetal nature of that dielectric field. And that's one of the reasons we're here in Melbourne, 
is play. And it's wonderful that there's all these people in Melbourne who function as a team that want to do this, thanks to Ian. And others. And others. <laughs> Yes. In fact, obviously the, the egg shape will be even better than the concentric cylinders. And concentric eggs will be, and you know, the, the Joe Cell people are using concentric spheres, it's a good start. But concentric eggs, even better. Yeah. And also I should mention that spheres for houses are lousy ideas, but eggs for houses are wonderful ideas. And the clue to understand that is your doctor knows that the cell in your body is cancer by checking to see if it's a sphere. Because it's a charge isolator and not a charge distributor. And yes, sir. There's a hint that um, through your science and, and the way, way you know, your reasons you took, but the ability through your knowledge and, and your, your aptitude, as I said, I suggested, you would actually probably have the ability to take all the, the stress energy from the sun and uh, probably funnel it through into a modeling and storage it and, and then siphon it off into uh, using the technology into various areas to convert the energy into useful processes rather than having it all dissipate through our structural things. I was saying that this energy that we are experiencing is weather change, climate, and we could actually grab it and through your technology and awareness of that, we could somehow as a thought form, use that incredible amount of charged energy and redistribute it in a way. Well, yes, and ultimately, you're describing it, you, you think you're describing a technology, and you are, but ultimately what you're describing is human bliss process. And ultimately, the final storage and distribution for, for self-organizing charge is living plasma. So, so the form in which this takes in serious evolution is Kundalini itself. And in Kundalini itself, there is a direct effect on the sun, and I've been there and I felt that. And my teacher, Bentoff, who wrote the book on the biomechanics of Kundalini, wrote about his experiences seeing through the sun like an eyeball. And this is advanced shamanic science, and it is where we're going. But I will say, you know, it's fun to learn from machines, but ultimately I can tell you for sure you're not looking for a machine. You're learning from the machines. What you're looking for is what to do with the beautiful plasma of your own aura, truly. Yeah. And it's fine to learn from some gadgets. It's fun. It's OK. Yeah. But ultimately, what you're looking for is when your plasma is going through the sun. And it's very fun. Very fun, truly. So on that note, unless there's any other questions. We're, uh, we're going to do the, um, the history and science of alchemy as an introduction to John Dee and all that story. Uh, it's February 11th, the Astro Gathering. Yeah? And that's part of what the announcement that Ian has mailed up. Yeah? So thank, thank you, everybody. Also on the Project thank. website, um, findtechsolutions.com. And uh, we've got all the three meetings listed, so um, please check that out. We're planning, to, we're planning to be a shareable wave. There's a pile of um, DVDs over there of Dan's. And look, if you oh, want yeah. to do an ad on that, Dan. Th this, this is, um, there's a, an hour and a half interview on the technology, on, a serious interview on the technology aspect. And then there's the course we did in Byron on the science. It's a very good pair that Ian made more copies of this. And the price on this is? What do we bid? <laughs> it was supposed to be 20 uh, Australian, but I think Ian said we gave him to 15 on Whatever. I suggested 15 and yeah. we'll fine. But here's some extra uh, copies. So, yes, you're welcome. Thanks. That is if everybody buys one. Thanks, everybody. Yeah. So, thanks for coming, everybody. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs>